Battle of Issus 333 BC. Alexander the Great, let's go. In our previous episode on the conquests of Alexander the Great, we covered how, after his first victory at the Granicus River, mm -hmm. the king successfully besieged the cities of Miletus and Halicarnassus, consolidating his hold on Western Asia Minor in the process. As Alexander was doing that, the Persian king of kings, Darius, was readying a royal Persian army to come and confront him. Now the ascendant Macedonian war machine was set to advance east, and the okay. hardest Persian juggernaut was coming west. The only possible result was a clash of titans. Yeah, it was so inevitable really, again, wasn't it? We cover the first of the truly grand scale battles in Alexander's war of conquest, the Battle of Issus. <laughs> Alexander found himself in many hairy situations because of his rashness, but our advice is to avoid any situations where hair can be problematic. He did the army in too. Prefers at plus two free gifts. Coming in, Alexander, what you got for us? Prefers at Halicarnassus had been settled. Alexander divided the army in two. Mm -hmm. Parmenion marched off to the north with orders to secure the inland territories of Asia Minor between Sardis and Gordium while Alexander took the rest on an eastward march along the coast. Moving into Lycia as 334... Oh, he's just taking each city one by one Mastodian easily. ...subdued and received the surrender of over 30 towns. Wow, 30. Xanthus and Phasilis. Following a brief spat with some Pisidian hillfort brigands, who reportedly burned their own families to death rather than have them fall into Macedonian hands, Alexander passed into Phrygia, and swiftly Whoa. reached the linchpin town of Kelene. As it possessed a nigh impregnable Acropolis, Alexander was forced to accept the defenders' terms that if no relief arrived within a certain period, they would surrender. Interesting, After okay. After waiting 10 days, the king decided to move on. To conclude matters at Kelene, Alexander appointed a relatively obscure old guard officer to serve as satrap of Phrygia mm -hmm. and assigned him 1,500 men to deal with any resistance. This aging, grizzled, but unassuming general would, in the course of three decades, rocket from a mere governorship in Phrygia to almost winning the entire empire Alexander was in the process of creating. He Interesting. Was the one eyed. Okay. Nice. From Kelene, Alexander marched north to Gordium, the ancient royal seat of the mythological Phrygian monarch Midas. Here, he cut or somehow otherwise undid the Gordian Knot, an act that traditionally dictated Alexander was destined to become ruler. I remember that from previ previous videos. Events elsewhere were to grant further credence to this mm. newfound destiny. After his dogged, albeit failed, defense of Halicarnassus. Memnon of Rhodes had finally been granted the great king's green light to carry out the strategy he'd proposed before the Granicus, scorched earth and a second front. How is that going to affect Alexander's Greek general, plenty of uh, plans? With which he energetically recruited another professional mercenary army and saw to the maintenance of his 300 to 400 mm -hmm. ship fleet. With this powerful seaborne force at his disposal, Memnon launched an assault on the Aegean Islands. Kos and Samos came over to the Persians, followed by Chios and even the great port Mytilene on Lesbos. Meanwhile, the Rhodians' agents and spies went through Greece, priming the always rebellious city-states to revolt against hmm. Alexander when the time was right. In strategic command, Memnon seems to have truly been in his element. Okay, of a sudden, it a seems like he was. The invasion of Greece looked entirely possible and Alexander's overextension into Asia Minor seemed foolish at best. However, at this moment of greatest danger and Memnon's highest point, the Rhodian general suddenly fell ill and died in summer 333. Ah, oh, another one of those what ifs. What if he didn't die? How much of a pain in Alexander's arse would he have been? How much Alexander, of a thorn in his side? The news at Ankara in May or June was elated. The indirect second front plan was Memnon's own, and mm. without its mastermind, the endeavor completely collapsed. Ah, oh, what a shame! When the disastrous news reached Susa, Darius III called together a conclave mm -hmm. of senior advisors and allies to establish what exactly was to be done. 
What is Darius the Third going to do? The Persian counselors advised Darius to confront Alexander now in person. The troops would fight better with their great king alongside them. One of the detractors, a fervently anti-Macedonian Athenian mercenary commander exiled by Alexander, mm, exiled by him. hotly argued that it was sheer stupidity to risk the empire on such a gamble. An experienced general, such as himself, he argued, somewhat self-servingly, wanted <laughs> to be sent to conduct the war. Darius agreed at first, but the throng of Persian advisers balked at the idea and shouted it down even accusing the Greek of wanting to betray them to Alexander. Mm, understandable. The Caridamus shot back, raving about the Persian lack of fighting will and manliness. His tirade so offended Darius that the king subsequently had Caridamus executed. <gasps> that teaches you for opening up your gob too much in front of the wrong people. Do not think you're bigger than who you are. That's a lesson right there. From Susa, therefore, what an the idiot. King marched to Babylon, gathered his many vassals from across the empire, and summoned their armies. Meanwhile, at Ankara, Alexander received the altogether insincere submission of the provinces of Cappadocia and Paphlagonia mm -hmm. before marching southeast to the Salesian Gates, which was held by a small force of Artemis's troops. However, in a stroke of luck, Alexander would later recount as his greatest, Artemis and most of his men were busy burning and ruining the Cilician plain in accordance to Memnon's scorched earth strategy. I see. Alexander to seize the mountain pass in a night attack. Realizing what had just happened, Arsamis fled to yeah, had no choice. King, and Alexander entered Tarsus on September 3rd, 333. After jumping into a freezing river, the king was left debilitated by a bout of illness for several weeks. Ooh, During he, this time, he nearly risked his life for for that. Sent Parmenian around the Gulf of Alexandretta to scout out the situation and hold the crucial passes between Syria, Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. and Anatolia. In the course of this mission, Parmenian established a base of operations at a small town called Issus and established that a massive Persian army was occupying Soki beyond the Syrian gates. Once Alexander recovered, he marched the entire army around the Gulf. Perhaps acting on misinformation, the king left his wounded at Issus before continuing south and arriving opposite the Syrian gates okay. where he expected Darius to come from. Yeah. He didn't, preparing for his coming stroke by sending his baggage to Damascus. Instead, employing what in hindsight was a brilliant strategic maneuver, the Persian royal army, accompanied by Darius's wife, mother and children, as was Persian custom, circled around. And I remember what happens to them later on in the story. It took a long route through the northern Amanic Gate, descending on Issus from the north. Mm, Every very smart Darius. found there had his hand severed, and Alexander was now cut off. Shit. Initially not believing that the Persians were behind him, Alexander sent a galley up the coast to establish the truth. When the vessel returned with confirmation that Darius was indeed at hand, the king immediately grasped the severity of the situation mm -hmm. and gathered the unit commanders. He gave a speech, first emphasizing how superior in the arts of war they were than the enemy, and then of the advantages to be gained. Nice. Okay. While the Persians occupied a position on the Issus Plain in the late afternoon... Bringing that morale back to his troops, go on Alexander. Alexander, who was about a dozen miles south, fed the bulk of his army a hot meal in preparation for the coming march. At the same time, the king sent mounted scouts to scope mm -hmm. out the road between the Macedonian army and its destination. When night fell, Alexander marched his whole army to the high ground at a pass known as the Pillar of Jonah, from where he could see the Achaemenid campfires glimmering across the plain. The well-fed soldiery now also got the rest and recuperation it required sleeping for many hours. Just before daybreak, the army rose from its slumber and began a disciplined march up the narrow coastal road. Okay then, confined to how's the Alexander going to deal with this? With infantry units in front and cavalry behind, more Macedonian warriors were gradually brought forward as the terrain opened up, slotting seamlessly into the formation. When Darius received word that Alexander was closing in, Contrary to his expectations, he 
he sent a force of skirmishers and most of the cavalry to forge the Pinarus, mm -hmm. aiming to prevent the Macedonians interrupting or even seeing his deployment. It was probably around this time that Alexander arrived opposite the stream with his infantry regiments lined up with the sea on his left and foothills to the right. The majority of Alexander's cavalry now massed on the right flank, and all of a sudden, the long-awaited showdown was now imminent. Coming in. Introducing the hide and seek from Belroy. A traditional wallet on the outside, it hides a few tricks on the in. It is incredibly difficult Coming in. to What's going to happen exactly in this battle? How many soldiers Darius III had with him at Issus in 333. A fact that makes charting the course of the battle that much harder. Mm, very Typically difficult. Typically hyperbolic ancient sources, such as Arian and Plutarch, estimate Persian strength as anywhere from 250,000 no. all the way to 600,000. Can't numbers be. Numbers which are clearly excessive. 60 to 80,000 max? Favoring the other extreme, state that Darius' army was no larger than Alexander's, at between 40 and 60,000. Mm -hmm. For our purposes, we will estimate that the Persian army at Issus was around 100,000 okay. strong, outnumbering Alexander 2 to 1. King of Kings Darius III, manning the royal chariot, was stationed front and center. Surrounding his immediate person were the infamous Persian immortals, the royal bodyguard, whose number never dropped below 10,000. Mm. Off to either flank were 10,000 Greek mercenaries, and further still were units of mixed Persian infantry, known as Kadekis, fronted by archers. The second line was made up entirely of lightly equipped levies. Now that the infantry was arrayed, Darius brought his myriad cavalry back across the Pinarus. Our sources tell us of Medes and Hyrcanians, but we can infer the presence of Paphlagonians, Cappadocians, Cilicians, Oh, so the cavalry was just all sorts of um, nomads from beyond the frontier. Were full of all sorts of people from all sorts of parts of his kingdom. Sitting on the flatter seaward side of the battlefield, another small Persian unit was sent to occupy the hills behind Darius's extreme left flank to threaten the Macedonian right flank and rear. As with his infantry deployment at the Granicus a year earlier, Alexander's main battle line Sarissa Phalanx mm -hmm. was divided into six brigades. They were led from left to right by officers Amentus, Ptolemy, Melega, Craterus, Perdiccas, and Coenus. Okay. To the left of the standard phalanx were Cretan archers and Thracian javelinmen, while to the right were the elite Hypaspians. There were so the many soldiers were involved in this battle. by the Macedonian king and his customary strike force, companion cavalry under Philotus, Paeonian light horse, Agrianes, and archers, supplemented by the Thessalian division. Mm -hmm. His army was still about 40,000 strong in total. Both forces now prepared for the clash to come. But Alexander saw two matters of concern that required attention. First and foremost was the overwhelming concentration of devastating Achaemenid cavalry opposing Parmenian on the left. If yeah, the order of quiet. battle stayed as it was, Darius's horse would simply sweep his army off the field. To remedy this, mm -hmm. the king swiftly adjusted his plan sending the Thessalians across the battlefield to reinforce his second mm -hmm. in command as covertly as possible. Second, but still troublesome, were the Persian ambushers positioned in the hills. Alexander dealt with them by detaching a force of Agrianes and light cavalry, and sending them to secure the heights while the main battle went ahead. All right. However, the pinpoint accuracy of the slingers comprising part of this raiding force succeeded in dislodging the enemy so nice. quickly that his bulk was able to rejoin the main line of battle. Mate, go on to those fucking skirmishes. Go on to those skirmishes. Just 300 cavalry were seconded to keep an eye on the skittish enemy. With his concerns dealt with, Alexander ordered a slow, measured and deliberate advance to begin across his entire line, periodically halting in order to bait Darius into attacking first. Mm -hmm. The Persian king did not fall for it, instead keeping his line solidly behind the Pinarus. At last, when the armies were about to enter missile range, Alexander rode from one end of his line to the other, shouting words of encouragement to the highest officers and the lowliest footmen alike. Go on, Alexander. He told the Macedonians of their valour and Philip, the Greeks of the injuries Persia had inflicted mm. in the centuries past, and the loot-oriented Thracians of the booty that was waiting just for them. 
Inspiring mm. all as he always does, right Alexander. Wing. The Persian front raised a great cry of battle, which was then returned by the Macedonians with equal vigor. Then, almost simultaneously, both Darius's massed cavalry on the seaward flank and Alexander's strike force on the other side of the field, together with the central Macedonian phalanx, launched their attempted hmm. hammer blows. It was now a question of time. Parmenian's Thessalian and allied cavalry was beleaguered and outnumbered, and would eventually collapse. But would that crunch point come before Alexander could win the battle? The warrior king of Macedon charged directly that, across the that, Belarus, at the head of his picked fourth... The flank with the uh, cavalry on seems to be getting pushed back on Alexander's side. It's not looking good. Companions and others. Delivering a critical Alexander. strike to the units opposing him almost immediately. The Xiston wielding cavalry wedge first smashed into the screen of Achaemenid archers, killing many and driving the rest back into the infantry behind them. Mm -hmm. Without slowing for a moment, Alexander barreled on and smashed through the first infantry line as well, utterly collapsing Darius's left wing. Okay, so Alexander's right wing seems to be doing really, really well, but the left wing is just getting pushed. Essentially surrounded by the Persian cavalry and fighting a losing battle, but that was to be expected. Mm -hmm. More disconcerting was the situation in the center of the battlefield. Perhaps drawn in the wake of their king's charge, some of the rightward phalanx regiments and hypaspists had drifted yet further to the right, opening up a gap in the line. This, combined with the rough terrain near the stream, diminished the integrity of the wall of Macedonian Sarissa. Before the phalangites could regroup on the far bank and reorder their formation, Darius's highly trained Greek mercenary contingent, loud and strong, and armed with shorter spears that were better suited to such uneven ground, came to grips with them. Shit. I chose Wix for my business because of its massive scope for functionality and freedom. What ensued was a brutal slogging mm. match. Macedonian soldiers fighting tooth and nail to best their Greek enemies amid the steep... Come on, Alexandra. Come and save this fight. The inflexible phalanx's inexorable advance proved itself exorable indeed. Noticing the newly opened gulf between the Macedonian infantry units, a force of Greek mercenaries attempted to drive into it and break the invaders' phalanx apart. All of a sudden, the phalangites began withdrawing. The situation might have turned especially sour. Look at that, it'd be disgusting. Column, it'd be horrible to be fighting like that. Officers ...who fought to keep the line steady and plug the gap. 120 of them lost their lives in this ferocious 120. Battle, together with Ptolemy himself. Still, the momentum in the center was with the Persians. Fresh from his relatively simple task of rolling up Darius's left wing, Alexander got as good a look as he could at the state of the battlefield and quickly decided nice. what to do next. Come on, what did you do? Shooting inward from the now exposed Persian left, the companions swung around and charged the flank mm -hmm. and rear of the Greek mm -hmm. mercenaries in the center. This assault relieved a significant amount of pressure on the Macedonian phalanx, allowing it to regain formation and continue advancing across the river. Nice. Come on, boys. The has now shifted the other way. Now, either by accident or on purpose, Alexander and his elites found themselves tantalizingly close to Darius's position. The king laid eyes on the Persian great king and with Homeric spirit launched an all-out attack intent on seizing Darius and ending the war. <clears throat> Observing the danger, Darius's dutiful brother Oxathres led the royal cavalry bodyguard into Alexander's path, who, despite fighting doggedly, were promptly slaughtered. In the desperate struggle, one source relates Mate. how Darius even managed to wound Alexander in the leg before being carried into danger by the spooked horses of his royal chariot. Mm. The second vehicle was quickly brought up, allowing the king to flee the battlefield. Seeing the departure of their near deific monarch and the collapse of their infantry, that was it. Cavalry assailing Armenian Alexander, Alexander was so close to capturing him. Imagine if he got him there and then. Along with the rest of the army. Arius what a of the victory. Battle, on the other hand, differs significantly. Oh, okay. In What's the second version, one? Once Alexander had routed the Persian ambushers stationed on his side of the river, he slowly advanced his army to the river. 
As soon as he came within missile range of the Persians, the Macedonian king initiated the battle, charging across the river with his companions to minimize casualties from the arrow fire. Interesting. This detachment crashed into the Persian left flank, forcing them to give ground. In the center, however, the Persian force was pushing back the Macedonian phalanx as it attempted to scale the banks of the river, and Greek mercenaries were also attacking the phalanx's right flank. So in this one, it seems like Darius's forces are getting the upper hand. Left exposed due to Alexander's charge. More importantly, the Persian right had charged Parmenian's wing once the phalanx was engaged, and was pushing back the Thessalians placed against them. This, then, was the moment of crisis. The Macedonian centre and left needed to hold long enough for Alexander to rout the Persian left mm -hmm. and swing back to be the hammer on the anvil. Fortunately, Alexander's initial charge had been devastating and the Persian left soon crumbled. Quickly he gathered his force together once again and rode to the rescue of the Phalanx, hitting the Persian centre in the flank and rear. It was at this point that Darius, seeing his left flank destroyed and his centre near surrounded, fled the battle. The Persian right flank, though having been rather successful in their fight against Parmenian's flank, saw that the battle was now lost and pulled back, initiating a general rout. Well, I hope it's the first battle that was true, because Alexander and Darius having a little tussle would have been much more interesting and much more entertaining. By all accounts, the Battle of Issus was over by early evening, mm -hmm. but Alexander wasn't close to finished yet. No, he's going the after Darius' ass. Give it to me. He wanted Darius. So no, 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 no. Macedonian soldiery set about killing Persian stragglers and looting the great king's staggeringly lavish camp. The victorious monarch began chasing Darius, who was about half a mile ahead of his cavalry. Only 25 miles later, when darkness finally fell, did Alexander return empty mm, Darius He tried to cross the mountains. He done his meantime, best. The triumphant Macedonian army had been dividing the spoils of victory in the Persian camp. This included vast quantities of gold, silver, fine clothes, jewelry, and as a consequence of Persian custom, all of the royal women who had accompanied their king of kings to the battlefield. All of the royal women. The less noteworthy of these captives were treated incredibly poorly by mm -hmm. the soldiery. Mm -hmm. There are myriad stories about what Alexander did when he returned. These include Alexander's care and reverence towards Darius' immediate family, and the king's good humour when Darius' mother mistook the king's friend and likely lover Hephaestion for Alexander. <laughs> but the most telling is related by Plutarch. Upon returning from pursuit, Alexander came to the royal tent, which had been prepared for him by pages, overflowing as it was with luxurious furniture, beautiful servants, and treasures beyond count. Walking further into the magnificent property at mm -hmm. the floor of his closest companions, Alexander saw the great golden bath of the king. The basins and pitchers and tubs and caskets, all of gold and curiously wrought. Although a royal and used to comfort, the Macedonians would have almost certainly never seen anything like this. So it was a shock even for it. him. So after surveying his prodigious new wealth, Alexander turned to his friends and said the words, This, as it would seem, is to be a king. Hmm. These post-battle anecdotes are particularly illustrative to us. Yeah. Arian writes how he cannot but admire Alexander for treating the royal women with such respect and being magnanimous in victory, thereby highlighting the king's admirable personality. But this initial taste of oriental luxury and Alexander's reaction to it foreshadows the near despot that he would eventually become. It's a shame you start off so nice. But for now, Alexander had won the Battle of Issus in emphatic fashion. But when people do worship you like a god, then of course the way you see the world is going to change. With it, the western half it's of inevitable. the Empire was now open for conquest. In the next episode, we will talk about the Siege of Tyre. Mm, if you're you looking forward to that video, one. Make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. And you know I have. I thoroughly enjoyed this reaction. I'm looking forward to the next one. And I hope you guys are as well. If you enjoyed this reaction, then you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell. If you haven't already, head over to Kings in General page. That link's in the description box down below. And I will catch you in the next video.